Hi guys, uh, thank you and uh, to Doug and Glenn and Jennifer, thank you again for being invited back. Um, I, I, if I can take 15 minutes of your time, I'm gonna use a little cognitive dissonance on you. You're gonna learn so many great things this weekend, uh, whether you're a newbie or you've been at this for a while. Um, but I wanna talk about kind of our converging fields and how I think we can um, actually enjoy things and actually kind of protect our future uh, by collaborating versus competing. So I, I presume you believe that this wasn't gonna be a talk about how we should remain competitors. Let me just get the next slide here. So just a little bit about myself very, very quickly. I've been doing this for a while. I'm not a person who really has done any interventions, um, but I realize the longer I'm in my career, the more critical my relationships with my interventional pain docs is. <laughs> And I'm gonna use something kind of boring, which is epidural steroid injections, to talk about the first half of the talk about collaboration, but then I wanna dive a little deeper into some things that I think are much more relevant moving forward. So I'm gonna go back in time to the, what I call the decade of the ESI. I finished training in 1998, which seems like a long time ago. And when I was in training, epidural steroid injections were used actually pretty rarely. And actually there were surgeons back then who did them more than the other specialties. And to be clear now in 2022, I think it's good we have an understanding of just how many spinal injections are done compared to other procedures. Now part of that is epidural blocks for anesthesia and other things, but that's a big number. By any estimation, that's one of the biggest interventions in the United States that's done for a variety of reasons, but a lot of those are for spinal pain, obviously. I got a couple busy slides I apologize about, but I've tried to highlight things if you go back and look at this. And I want you to know that in that decade, that epidural steroid injections were increasing at a near geometric rate, especially among PM&R dogs. They were used more frequently, whether that's because more people were trained in how to do them, whether uh, there were other incentives of doing them, I don't know, but there was massive growth. And whenever there's massive growth of a procedure, people take notice of that, both physicians and the people who pay for it. So this paper by Cohen in 2013 tried to look at a retrospective review of 45 studies. And I, I think it's important to say that this study basically concluded in part, there's considerable controversy around efficacy and safety. Um, Medicare services, the FDA and payers don't like procedures where there's not clear efficacy or they believe there's not clear efficacy and there's safety issues. They went on, he went on to say that there's no clinical trials comparing how much of this we should, we should be doing. There's some effectiveness, I guess, that's what I took away from this paper, but there's no real protocol for doing this. And when you couple that with near geometric growth, and I could give you other examples in the surgical world where there's been geometric growth of procedures, People take notice. The FDA took so much notice that in April of 2014, they put out a statement. And when the FDA puts out a statement about anything, it does make national news. And I can remember patients, when I would refer them to get epidurals, would say, hey, did you see that thing about the FDA saying that this could be a dangerous procedure? And I never thought of it a dangerous procedure. I knew there were risks, particularly of cervical injections. Um, but it's not something I thought about. But I would say this is also the first time that there was really collaboration between spine interventionalists and surgeons who basically took the time to basically say, we're gonna to come together as a group and we're gonna show that these are safe, effective, and there is a value proposition here. And they requested that the FDA change their language and basically say that these are safe and they can be effective, okay? And, and their rationale was the alternatives to epidural steroid injection are excessive opioid use, NSAID use, and the complications associated with it. We could debate all day as to whether that was meaningful criteria. I think it was. But I want you to see the group that came together to basically release this statement. We've got cats and dogs living together. Neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, pain management, PM&R, and anesthesiology, okay? So when I gave this talk in 2021, a very bright person sitting over there and said, uh, you know, um, the spine surgeon just said that pain interventional doctors shouldn't really be doing any other interventions in the spine that include any sort of stabilization or fusion. 
And so this is what we talked about briefly, and that is the major professional societies of orthopedic and neurosurgery basically wanted to release a position statement about arthrodesis, and I want you all to notice arthrodesis by the non-spine surgery, which is fusion, right? And a very important, powerful political group, those are our professional societies. Um, and this was their conclusion, which really is about a lot more than arthrodesis. And basically that surgical stabilizing innervation for spinal degeneration falls exclusively with the neurosurgeon and the orthopedic surgeons. Um, we talked about it a bit in 2001 with this group. I think it was pretty politically motivated. Again, there's other reasons for it, which are probably too much of a rat hole to go in for this talk. But we're in 24 now, and let's talk about the reality. This is reality. That's partly why I'm here, is experts across multiple disciplines are going to be doing spine stabilization. So we better learn to get along because this is really important in us doing best for our patients and protecting our expertise in this, okay? So I don't want to go talk about this too much except to say I don't think that that position statement really changed the world at all. And I think 10, 20 years from now, there's even going to be more synthesis between our groups, leveraging our expertise. Because my expertise is different than Neil Shoners, is different than Jennifer's, is different than Glenn David, is different than Doug's. Okay, I'm gonna get a little preachy now. I'm sorry about that. This is really important to me, okay? Because it makes my engagement better. I want to make your engagement better. You're dealing with experts this weekend who believe in all these things. Three E's, learn a good neurologic and musculoskeletal exam. I know that goes without saying. It's really about how technically good you are this weekend and learning these incredible techniques. Know it like the back of your ham. Know how to do it quickly and rapidly. If there's one thing I still enjoy after 25 years is making a diagnosis that others have missed or challenging and not focusing so much on the radiograph. Educate, the next E. Your patients are going to get their MRI report. I don't care if this is hip, knee, spine. They're going to get that report. They're going to read it. They'll probably put it in a chat GPT sort of version and get some synthesizers. And then they're going to get on Google and they have become an expert. They are the expert. They're going to tell you that they are. They're going to tell you what they've read. And that's where you're going to have to really educate your patient and engage with them, OK? It's just going to, you're going to see it when it comes. And you're going to say, I don't want them to go down this hole where they really not have the context of their disease. If you look at spine care providers who get the base, best patient satisfaction ratings, are they neurosurgeons? No. Orthopedic surgeons? No. Pain docs? No. Physical therapists? No. It is chiropractors. And if you look at why patients say it's chiropractors, because they took the time to discuss the pictures with me and my disease. Okay? Really important, because your patients are going to be surveyed by payers to say, what did you think of Dr. Smith and the job they did? More and more and more and more. Okay? Last one's elucidate. What is the patient looking for? Are they trying to go on their 40th anniversary trip and they want to be able to walk on a cruise ship? Do they want to get back to work? Are they trying to come down on their opioids? Do they just try to get to their meals in the nursing home? That, in, that is very important to understand where their expectation is, okay? So that's, I'm going to tell you that part of this, part of collaboration is engagement and you have to engage with your patients. It's going to be important. And you've got to be able to do it rapidly and efficiently and effectively. Real quick, I get this from patients when I request a epidural steroid injection, all these different things. I want to be able to very rapidly talk them down from all these things and why they're not relevant. But engagement is part of it. They're trusting me to be a trusted source. This is what's coming. And they will often say, but I went to the Mayo Clinic or the Johns Hopkins or Texas Back Institute website. And I want, again, just take a moment to look at this. In bold, when injected, it may temporarily reduce inflammation and replenishment. First of all, temporarily. Most people are not coming in for a temporary fix. And the first three sentences are about all the terrible things that can happen from an epidural steroid injection. And I would consider the Mayo Clinic a reliable source. So again, you become the expert with, for the patient, okay? By engaging with them and knowing what's coming. I, it's not any easier in surgery, okay? 
People do not walk into my office and say, I, you don't even have to explain to me, Nora, I know you're great, you've been doing it for a long time. They're gonna have all this misinformation also, okay? Nor do I want Dr. Smith, the pain doctor, basically referring to me and the patient says, I don't know why Dr. Smith sent me to you. And I'll say, you know that I'm a spine surgeon. And they say, I don't, I, I don't want surgery. Is this what this is about? We're here to talk about surgery? Well, Dr. Smith said, didn't really tell me anything about where you were going. This is engagement. This is now starting to be engagement between practitioners, okay? We've got to communicate as physicians, and I know there are so many tools to communicate, email, text, take the time at conference. I, I, not a day of my life goes by clinically while I'm not calling some doctor, see him in the hall. Can we just have a quick sidebar? I want to talk to you about this patient. I've looked at their scans. I'm not really sure what you want. Or it's not clear to me. I've been into the electronic medical record. It seems kind of vague to me. Makes my job more interesting, makes the patient much more confident in how they're being cared for. It doesn't take that much time. And if you don't do it on the back end, you waste so much other time. You put all that time in with the patient and they don't actually want you to do their procedure because they didn't have the confidence that you were engaged, okay? So why collaborate? As my godfather surgeon said, Happiness is, uh, or money isn't everything, happiness is 3%. I say that jokingly, okay? He also said table manners tend to go away when dessert gets smaller, okay? Some of the old guys in the room know what that means. There are plenty of people to take care of. This is not, an un this is not a dwindling disease. Spinal disease is going up. People are living longer, getting more active. I'm treating people now in their 80s and 90s that I wouldn't have treated 20 years ago, partly because of technology, but they're living longer and more healthy. So let's get it right. Let's not, as they sometimes say, screw the pooch, pardon my French. Let's really clear it. Let's own this, because I'm gonna talk about it in a moment. Other people want to own this, who aren't practitioners, who aren't invested in this the way we need to be. And they would love in some ways for us to be more divided in this. They'd love to go to kind of the lowest bidder of this. We don't want that, okay? So this all sounds good. Payers are increasingly requiring physician healthcare systems to create triple aim. Cost effectiveness, quality outcomes, patient satisfaction. That's very true, okay? We have to use our know-how to dictate the terms of that. Again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. It's not the pain center and the surgery center the radiology center and the chiropractic center, there has to be an amalgam of those groups really setting the imperative, okay? As I just said, this is gonna be multiple groups. A siloed approach is going to lead a path to a really bad place. We've got this great technology, which you're gonna learn about today. And I am the first one to admit that this new technology is very exciting. Some of which I'll participate in, some of which I, I won't. I've got other parts of my life too. I can't do everything either. I've got brain stuff to do too, okay? But it's really important now that we use this technology to leverage it, but without collaboration, it's gonna be a problem. Let's just talk about a quick diagnosis that all of you are gonna see, at least you're all gonna see that I see, okay? It's probably the most common thing you're gonna see in the population above 60 years old. And I've got listed for you four different procedures, and we'll talk about the fifth one in a moment. But I could easily put in there facet ablation and epidural steroid injection. <laughs> I've got six procedures, and I can tell you with the same cohort of patients, with the same radiology, and basically the same health, those can be successful. And I can also tell you, they can all be an utter failure. Like, regrettable that we chose that approach, or it was effective for such a short period of time. This is hugely important in terms of collaboration. I might not use one of these techniques on a regular basis, but I want to be with the people who do, and I really want to understand what they've seen. This is conference, spine conference, this is talking in the hall. This is developing with your colleagues best practice in a spine center, okay? And again, I don't want to get in your head too much. I want you to learn technology this weekend from the national and international experts, but this is really important. I put total disc facet and arthro arthroplasty on there for a reason. 
Essentially, it's been kind of the holy grail for spine surgeons that this is coming since when I graduated in 98. Essentially, we've got a knee or a hip replacement for the spine, okay? It's not gonna quite, I don't think in the next 10 years it's gonna quite revolutionize things the way we thought it might. For a lot of reasons we won't go down into the discussion of. From implantation to choosing the right patient to durability to revision, okay? Just keeping in mind, the spine naturally gets stiffer and degenerate as we get older, okay? <laughs> and you can't take spinal segment disease and take hip or knees disease and make certain types of equivalencies. They are different loads, different centers of access of energy put through it, right? So I don't, I, again, I was at a recent round table t looking at all the new data on these complete facet and disc arthroplasties. It, it's exciting, but it's incredibly daunting in thinking that's really gonna be implemented in the near term for a lot of reasons, okay? So really important slide, really simple. This is my brilliant idea, but I want you to just get this in your brains, please, okay? The value of your interventions is gonna be a combination of patient outcome, which we kind of get to actually define, and the durability of those divided by cost. It's been around forever, I'm not breaking any new ground. We've gotta own every bit of this numerator and this denominator. And the only way we'll really do that is engaging with each other and our patients and collaborating. Because, getting back, and I don't wanna make the payers nefarious, the payers are what they are. They've got very, very powerful tools which are evolving to dictate the terms of not just the denominator, the numerator, okay? We've gotta decide again what are deliverables for our patient in terms of their health and well-being and be very honest and upfront about it. We, we want to keep the, mile, the, the moral high ground, right? We studied hard, we trained hard, and this is really important, okay? That we really, across different specialties, discipline, expertise, we bring this together, okay? It used to be when I graduated, just become technically great, the rest will take care of itself. Okay? And, I, and I agree with that. Be really, be an expert in your field, but it has to be more. It doesn't all fall on you, but leverage your colleagues to help answer that. So final thoughts. The first two, educate, excuse me, the first three is educate your patient, communicate accurately, collaborate with your colleagues. That is the engagement I'm strongly recommending. And I won't, I know in this audience there's people who've been at it for a while, people who are just recently graduating or about to graduate. It's never been more important. Be an innovator, okay? Innovator, technically, innovator in care delivery. And it's, it's, not, I'm not, it's not that difficult. It's talking and being present with your colleagues. And do recognize that value equation, okay? There are people who just want you to be technically good and not worry about the other stuff. It's not your job as a physician, a practitioner, to really worry, we just be good and do your thing. We'll worry about all these other things of cost and implementation. No, it, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's what an old guy like me was taught. It's not enough, it's not sufficient for the moment, okay? So I'm gonna leave you with this last slide which I put in every talk, which is my favorite, you, some of you know the New Yorker magazine. And this is how neurosurgeons feel sometimes at the end of a long case. As we say in surgery, nothing ruins a great case like long-term follow-up. Thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? I love that. Um, ready? Next up.